Hello, everyone. Many thanks for your time at short notice. Uh, my name is Nicholas Reed from Reed Corporate, and on behalf of Orion Minerals, I'd like to welcome you to this Zoom call on what is obviously a very important day for the company. We have a number of participants on today's call, joining us from multiple time zones, spanning from the east coast of Australia, WA, through to Johannesburg in South Africa. Earlier this morning, Orion released an updated bankable feasibility study to the market for its Prisca copper zinc project located in South Africa's Northern Cape. The updated BFS has delivered substantial increases in production, cash flow and mine life, amongst many other operational efficiencies, enhanced sustainability credentials, and importantly, very strong financial returns. To walk us through the updated BFS, the current status of the Prisca project, and also to bring us up to speed on the exciting recent developments at Orion's Nickel Copper Exploration Joint Venture with IGO and the Fraser Range. We are joined on this call from South Africa by Orion's Managing Director, Errol Smart. It's 5 a.m. in South Africa, so Errol, firstly, thanks very much for joining us so early in the morning. Um, we're gonna do a quick sound check just to, hear, to check that you can hear us and, uh, and ask you to load up your presentation ready to go. Uh, Errol, can you Morning, hear us? Yeah. Thanks very much. Morning. We're also joined in the room here in Perth by Ryan's chairman, Dennis Riddell, who is also available to take questions or join the discussion. Errol will firstly run through his presentation, which includes a 3D fly through. And while he does so, all participants will be on mute in a listen-only mode. Once Errol is finished, he'll hand back to me and we'll open the floor for questions. Please click the raise hand function on Zoom if you would like to ask a question and we will announce your name and unmute you. Please note that this call is also being recorded and a recording will be available on the Orion Minerals website, uh, hopefully later today. So without any further ado, uh, Errol, thanks very much. Exciting news out today. Um, could I ask you please to run us through the presentation and uh, give us an update? Thanks very much. Yes, Nick. thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks everybody for making the time to join us. Um, it is a big day for us. You'll all remember that uh, Orion released our first bankable feasibility study for the Prisca project last year in June. And uh, we had a very strong project layout, but already in last year in June, we realized that there were a number of um, opportunities to further enhance the project. All right, you can flick to the next slide. Well, l let me first speak to this. So we've now completed an update on this bankable feasibility study. Um, it's been a long, hard haul to get it here. The last two to two and a half months of disruption through the COVID first um, partial lockdown and then complete lockdown has made it very difficult for Walter and his team. Walter is our C COO. They've done a fantastic job in getting this completed remotely. Um, I don't know how many other bankable feasibilities have been completed under this kind of, these kind of circumstances. Um, the new BFS basically adds 20% of production to what we published last year in June. Um, the project still operates at a 2.4 million ton per annum uh, production rate. Um, it uh, produces about 22,000 tons of copper and 70,000 tons of zinc per annum. Now with a life of mine of 12 years, it will produce 226,000 tons of copper and 680,000 tons of zinc during the two years, uh, during the 12 years of life. We have increased the free cash flow generated by this business to 1.6 billion Australian dollars. And that's even though we have reduced our metal price expectations on the project. Um, there's been an increase of, in NPV to 779 million Australian dollars. Just putting that in context, we've got a market cap of $50 million. We had one fifteenth the value of the NPV of this project. The project pays back um, in five, five months earlier than previously, now 2.4 years to pay back. All in sustaining margin, 47%. This is a very profitable operation. 
Um, we produce in the second quartile of copper producing costs um, on a global peer basis and in the lowest quartile of zinc production costs for the zinc production. Um, all of these improvements did come at a small price, um, a 9% increase in the peak funding requirement. So I think you'll agree with me, adding so much value for an additional, uh, it's about $50 million, um, has actually been pretty good for us. So permitting, we have got all of our permitting in place for the Repli um, project side. Um, you'll remember that this project has got two mining rights. Repli covers about 80% uh, of the project. We've got the mining right in place of that, granted in August last year. We have now got the environmental authorization for Vada Cube, which is the remaining section. That's the precursor to the grant of the mining right. So we've got our environmental authorization and the water use right um, was prepared and ready for signature before everybody went into lockdown. So hopefully on Monday when the public servants return to work in South Africa, we'll be able to move through the final permitting phases. I think you can go to the next slide. Somebody, can you flick to the next slide? Yep. Okay, I've got it. All right, um, so this is a video that will take you through the project quite well. Um, some of you would have seen an earlier version of this video. Um, we shortened it a little bit. So the project's midway between Johannesburg and Cape Town in the very desolate Northern Cape. The Northern Cape is a province home to a lot of large mines. This is just a sum of them, very large iron ore, manganese, zinc, copper um, mines. We've got more than 3,000 square kilometers of prospecting and mining rights. And in that southern mining rights area is where Copperton sits. Uh, with the Prisca town, 65 kilometers away on the Orange River, is a proper brick and mortar town. It's got all the main services we require, shops and schools and clinics and a, and a small hospital. There's a tar road that reaches the mine site and a water pipeline that follows the tar road all the way. The red is actually the Repli and Vardacube mining right area, and it's in the middle of existing solar plants. We already have over 170 megawatts of solar operating, and we will have our own dedicated solar and wind plant at that site over there. So zooming in on the mine, which was completely demolished in 1971 and the site rehabilitated largely, um, we see that all that remains is the main distribution substation that goes into the national grid. And that's where all the renewable energy connects into. The main concrete buildings were left, and that's a 20 story high the winding house over there. That's the decline entrance into the mine. And this marks the old stopes as they come out. The explosives magazines have been fully maintained by Donal Arms Corps, and we've taken back control of that. This is the ore body that was mined down to 970 meters. You see it was a steeply dipping ore body, and that's where they extracted 46 million tons historically, very successfully. Um, over 30 years, it is now flooded to 300 meters from surface. We're going to pump out eight and a half million cubes of water. We'll be using this Hutchins shaft, which is an eight meter diameter concrete line shaft to raise the ore to surface. We have multiple declines in fantastic rock conditions. Some of the best rock conditions that mining engineers have ever seen anywhere in the world. The old miners used pillars to support the workings. This blue area is where we're going to mine. Those pillars are not in our early mining phase, although it presents an opportunity for additional ore. There's more than 10 million tons there. So we are gonna mine this all body that goes to flat dipping. We've rescheduled the whole mining area and I'll show you a little bit later. The rescheduling was all designed about getting the best ore out earliest and most efficiently. And that's what's made the biggest impact on our feasibility study is actually just scheduling when we take what out. The mining method that we're going to use is a long haul open stoping. It's a very common mining method now used around the world by a lot of mining companies. 
in Australia, most large mines will be using this mining method. When you've extracted the ore, you've put up a wall and then you backfill, you use your tailings to actually backfill the hole and support it. So you don't leave fillers anymore. Where the ore is flat dipping, we use what's called the drift and fill method, where we mine essentially a wide tunnel. Once we've mined out the first tunnel, we build a wall again, we pump it full of tailings with a bit of cement so that it becomes strong and you can climb on top of it and you take the next slot out. Again, a very well used proven mining method, but it wasn't available in the 80s when this mine had to make a decision to close. The ore is taken back to an ore pass system, um, oversized rocks are broken down and then dropped down onto an existing rail tunnel. The whole 970 meter level has got a rail tunnel that runs the entire length of the mine. This is the most efficient way to mine, to move ore laterally across the mine. It's very efficient, very automated. Um, the ore gets dropped down to primary crushing underground, um, then loaded into a very automated skip loading system. 22 tons at a time get moved to surface every 150 seconds. We're moving 22 tons to surface. Very, very efficient and cheap mining. And that's why this mine is so exceptional. Because it's such a large continuous ore body and all your infrastructure is in place and you've got the benefit of that infrastructure, you can actually mine extremely low cost per tonne. Because the old plant was removed and rehabilitated, we get to put absolutely new plant in there. But this was proven technology. For 20 years, this plant had exceptionally good recoveries and produced exceptionally good um, concentrates. We're going to use the same process, but just newer machines to produce it. And that gives us a modern efficiency, but on a proven process. Um, the new process has sag milling at the core of it. So we no longer have secondary and tertiary crushing and screening. And we have separate zinc and, and copper flotation circuits producing concentrates that are taken into the sheds over here before they are loaded onto trucks and taken to the nearby rail siding, which is existing, it's in place, and we've got a fantastic opportunity there to move our concentrates via port to anywhere in the world. These thickeners are the precursor to the tailings being taken back underground. Actually, that copper thickener there moves actually there to the backfill plant at that corner and then is taken back underground. So zooming out, you can see this very efficient um, and neat plant. It's a very effective plant for what we need to get done but no whistles and bells, very similar to your very typical Australian mine, very dissimilar to any South African mine. South African mines are cluttered with infrastructure and very high capital expenditure. We will be putting in a new line tailings facility to do it. As I said, the trucks take the concentrate along the road. It's about a 40 kilometer distance to this existing rail siding. We'll have exclusive use of that rail siding. That then takes us into the national rail grid and actually takes us to nine regional ports. We've chosen the port of Kucha down over here to transport. Um, it's nice and convenient, South Africa, midway to Asia and to um, European smelters and refiners with a very sought after product. The new feasibility study as sees us bring, coming on production 33 months after we start construction. Um, so 2024, potentially in production, that's just when we expect that the world's return, recovering from the COVID contagion and the economies are returning and the metal demand rises. And that's quite important. You know, at the moment, obviously metal demand is all over the place. And we would imagine for the next year or two, we're gonna see metal prices all over the place. All of the um, commentators, all of the analysts, and we've relied on Standard and Poor um, S&P global consensus that was done in April. So it's been done post COVID contagion and lockdown. 
So everybody's seen what the impact is on the markets. And we expect that the metal prices are going to be rising strongly from 2024 onwards. And that's just when we come on production. And we come on production with a very low cost mining operation. People say to us, why is this such a low cost operation if you've got moderate grades? We don't have the highest grades in the world. But it's because we've got an exceptional ore body hosted by exceptional rock conditions. We've got such strong rock conditions that all the mining engineers have looked at this and including the contractors and obviously we've had burn cuts and mining plus looking at this. They've said that these are some of the strongest rock conditions that they've seen anywhere in the world. And we will not have to use the same meshing and lace, lacing and those expensive rock control conditions that are used elsewhere in the world. You know, that's the 400 meter shaft station at the moment. That's been standing for more than, well, it was excavated 50 years ago. It's been standing for 30 years with no maintenance and there's not a rock out of place. The rock conditions here are superb. It's very low temperature rock. It's a very long continuous ore body. We're mining an average of nine meter widths. It gets up to 33 meter widths. At places, the ore body is nearly 40 meters vertical height. You know, you could stand a 12-story building up in some of our stopes at the bottom of the mine. It's large-scale mining. It's simple. It's a continuous ore body. We use modern, efficient mining machines, very fourth industrial revolution, 4IR um, enabled, and it's got simple metallurgy. We don't have to fight a monster yet. We've got a 46 million ton bulk sample mine that achieved fantastic recovery all the time. People ask us, what about our tailings dam? Well, our tailings dams got very low value because they got all the metal out the first time and they produced very good recoveries. And that's why we will mine at such low operating costs. You know, $73 a ton Australian as a, as a C1 operating cost and $88 a ton Australian as an all-in sustaining cost. That's exceptional. With the metal grades that we've got, we'll be producing copper at $3,500 a ton. Um, zinc at $820 a ton. That is very low production costs. And as I said, that puts us in the second quartile for copper producers on a global peer comparison and in the lowest quartile for the zinc production costs. An all-in sustaining margin of 47% is exceptional for any project anywhere in the world. And this project in the middle of the desert in South Africa with no nearby um, large settlements and that human settlement pressure that you find in a lot of South African mines is the ideal situation to be in. So it's a modern 21st century design mine using majority of renewable energy in a desert area, but we put in new modern water treatment facility so that we maximize recycling and reuse of water. We've, over the last year, added a whole lot of opportunities with our metallurgical plant design that brought both the capex and the opex down, the dewatering and the, in, the insulation of water treatment facilities. Don't underrate this, people. This is so important for the investors and the financiers of this project. A lot of funds nowadays that derive their money from universities and the likes of those they have to tick these boxes otherwise they cannot uh, invest in mining projects and we absolutely rate in the top end of ESG our environmental social and governance planning for this mine is top class and that also gives us a, an opportunity with government funding in this post-COVID world the government is saying to South African businesses, show us large businesses that can create a lot of jobs very quickly and stimulate the economy. Well, this could be one of those. And that's where we see an opportunity. Now that we've finished the study, we'll be going back to speak to some of those development finance agencies. Um, our copper and zinc production profiles is what we did a lot of work on. Unfortunately, Production is pushed a little bit later than what we had before. So in this top graph, the orange is actually our new production profile, which continues much longer than what we had previously. Um, the 
black line over here was the June 19 line. You can see on average in the early period, we're producing more metal. And that's so important for us. We recover more metal earlier in the project line and that impacts your NPV of the project. So it is a 4IR enabled mine, um, very common for South Africa. Almost every mine, successful mine in Australia is using this kind of technology. There are only two mines in South Africa that are currently using this kind of technology. And so we're in the position of being rapid followers. We're not the developers, we're not the guinea pigs. We're not gonna be doing anything that isn't done commonly elsewhere. But what we do have is the ability to bring modern technology to South Africa and change the whole face of South African mining. There isn't a single junior miner in South Africa that's operating like this. It's only the Anglo-American uh, type companies and then Exara that are using this kind of operation. Um, the improved economics of this has come hand in hand because it's part of our entire business plan. It's not something that's a bolt on and a separate thing, but our whole solar and wind power, reuse of water, stimulating the agricultural um, industry around us and supporting our local community. It's all integrated in our mine plan and part of our costing and planning. In South Africa, we do have to have what it's called an SLP, which is approved by the government. And that's basically a commitment to invest in certain um, renewable, sustainable development projects. We have chosen water infrastructure because this is in a desert area as one of our major investments. But we'll be investing in skills, in training, in schools, residential development, um, we will locate our long-term mine village in the town of Prisca and we're going to up, upgrade the town of Prisca. We're just doing the planning of that. Independent developers will come in and do the construction and own it and rent us the accommodation and ultimately that accommodation will be sold back to the community. And then of course renewable energy. This site will have more than a gigawatt. You know, this mine only uses 35 megawatts. The site will have a gigawatt of renewable energy supply nets um, surrounding it by 2024. It's one of the biggest renewable energy production hubs, um, certainly in, in Africa, but in the whole Southern Hemisphere. It's a very large renewable energy hub because it's got the highest solar incidence, the highest continuous wind, it also has the highest evaporation, and that's why it's a desert area. We create, 840 jobs on a, on a continuous basis with the multiplier effect of 2,500 associated jobs. Almost all of our consumables, our capital items, and apart from our, our mining fleet, even some of the mining fleet is produced in South Africa, but almost everything is produced and available in South Africa. We only use South African resident employees. We don't have expats flying around. Our whole operating cost is reduced by that. And the skill set is available in South Africa. You know, you've got Anglo-American um, operating Mkholakwena, one of the most successful um, mines in the world, 4IR. You've got Exaro operating both surface and underground coal mines using 4IR. You've got um, De Beers De operating Messina Diamond Mine, the largest underground diamond mine in the world. Very efficient underground 4IR mines. The skills are available in South Africa and when we're not exporting them to Australia, those South Africans are very happy to stay at home and operate a mine like this. The district will increase dramatically and that's why we are likely to get even more support than what we have and we've already been recognized. I met President Ramaphosa in November this year where he congratulated us for this project. It is a project of national importance. It has been recognized now as one of the state president's um, projects. So by doing that, we get a lot of access to government and uh, support services. We have our black empowerment in place. Um, we announced this last year already on the 2nd of August last year. Proactive. We only need to have this in place in five years' time, but we elected to go in from day one and have it in place. Our 
employees and our community are shareholders in our mining operation. It's not a free carried interest, people. We do have to finance them, so we act as their bankers. But we recover that money on banking terms from the project. So that goes into our long-term cash flow. Um, our Prisca Resources, our BE partners, Safika is one of the biggest manganese producers in the world. Blackstar is a group of Prisca-born individuals that run a very successful mining contracting business um, based mostly in Kimberley nowadays, but they are local from the perspective from the town and from the province. And Kalubi Nala is Billy Mawasha, who stepped down last year as Managing Director of Rio Tinto, South Africa. So a very good quality B group that supports us there. The project financing, where will the money come from to build this? It is going to cost us $413 million of peak funding. We expect 60% of that money will come from senior debt and our new um, cash flow shows that that is supported. Um, there will be support, subordinated debt and structured finance facilities. Just a moment. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, we will have subordinated debt and structured finance facilities available. We obviously trying to avoid as many as the pitfalls as possible on offtake arrangements at this stage. Um, you can imagine your smelters and traders, um, those that are still standing and standing strong, they do have money. They're accessing it from very low yield uh, funds overseas and they prepare to make it available, but that always comes with hooks. So we speak to a number of them, and uh, there is opportunity there to possibly leverage some money. At the end of the day, there is gonna be an equity finance corner of it that will have to be funded about, I would imagine it's gonna be in the order of about 20% of the project financing. is gonna have to come from pure equity. Of that, we've gotta carry 80% of it, and the BE partners will have to carry 20% of it. So it's not an insurmountable challenge. It's a tough challenge with a market cap of 50 million, but I think as the market starts recognizing what we have and the opportunity now, because the opportunity doesn't just stop at the mine. Remember when we went into this project, we took it because it was a belt scale project. We've actually got now, it's about 3,300 square kilometers of prospecting and mining rights. We've got 22 known VMS copper zinc deposits. We've got 12 known intrusive nickel copper platinum deposits. Now these nickel copper platinum deposits and, and the VMSs, they occur in a geotectonic setting that is absolutely identical to the Fraser Range. And that's what led me to this area, is I went looking for another Fraser Range and with a with a mine ready to build and that's what we found for ourselves in 2016 but more and more as we've worked on this and as our joint venture partners of igo have looked at this and peter bradford has acknowledged that this is one of the most prospective geological belts that's underexplored in the world and we managed to tie up most of that belt and it's got exactly the same style of mineralization as you have in the Fraser Range. In the Fraser Range, all the focus has been on nickel exploration, and that's good, that's great. But they have discovered multiple VMSs now, and they've actually drilled copper and zinc discoveries in the Fraser Range, a number of them that have got quite a few holes into. And in fact, the Pike and Hook project, where we are in a joint venture with IGO, it's only 16 kilometers to hook from Legend Binding's Mawson project that has got all the, the focus of over the last few months. This is a combined VMS and nickel copper intrusive. Last year, IGO drilled a couple of diamond drill holes here. They intersected both nickel copper in ultramafic, sulfides in ultramafic, and they intersected copper zinc sulfides in VMS lithologies, all in this area over here. Unfortunately, this is a particularly tough area logistically, so it's taken them a while to get the roads upgraded so that they can get bigger rigs in here. They've drilled a well field, and um, I believe they're ready to move on here in the next quarter to 
to continue the diamond drilling. Of course, we watch with a lot of interest. And uh, it was interesting yesterday, you know, my son was standing looking over my shoulder as I was preparing this presentation. And he said to me, Dad, why is it that this book and I over here looks different when you put it in blow up? Well, I said to him, you've seen something that I haven't seen, but I should introduce you to a couple of highly paid geologists. Um, it's very interesting that the form of these shapes is almost identical. You've got the mag low, you've got the mag low, you've got a mag high, you've got a mag high. We are 16 kilometers long trench from Mawson. And over here, IGO have actually drilled the target sulfides that we're after. And that's what actually brings the opportunity to us. So the takeaway for this is we've got a build ready copper zinc project that's world class, very low cost producer, ready to go. It's in a district where we have multiple exploration opportunities in South Africa. And in Australia, we've got a free carried interest where IGO, one of the best exploration groups, are investing heavily and they're busy drilling on our property at the moment and the diamond drills will be turning shortly again. They're busy doing air core drilling right now. I don't see a better investment opportunity anywhere. Um, the kicker that can come out of this with a market cap of only $50 million, it's absolutely ludicrous. So I think I'll leave it over there. Um, Maybe I'll just scroll back quickly now that I've got control of the presentation um, to our corporate slide. So just to show you who's got what in the company. So we've currently got 2.9 billion shares out um, trading at 1.8 cents. I hope you guys are embarrassed. You should all be buying and nobody's buying this morning. So we'd like to see that move. We've been very well supported by Tembo Capital, a private equity fund. Um, they've just advanced us an additional million dollars so that we could get the feasibility completed. Um, so they stay very supportive and they've given us the assurance that they will follow their interests in any capital raisings that we do. Um, Wiley Group, United Super, IGO, all there as good shareholders. Uh, IGO, obviously, our joint venture partners in the Fraser Range, and their geologists have been to our site and spent weeks with us. They speak to us all the time, and our geological teams, we, we have information sharing and we, we learn from each other. And Dennis is Tani Holdings. Uh, most of you have met Dennis, our, our um, chairman, who's in Perth. So with that, I think I'll hand over control back to Nick and then we can take some uh, questions. Let me just hold and control back to Nick. Thanks very much, Errol. That's a great presentation. Um, we'll open the floor now to, to questions. So if I could just remind everyone, if you would like to ask a question, just please use the, uh, the raise hand function. On your on your console, and we will unmute you and allow you to ask your question. So just while we're waiting for that to happen, Errol, perhaps if I could kick off with one. Um, the company announced a strategic partnering process at, earlier this year, led by Macquarie, and obviously since then we've had a lot happen, including the, the COVID, the onset of the COVID pandemic, so the world's quite a different place to what it was when you announced that. But perhaps if, if you could give us a quick update on that process and also what is the significance of this updated study in respect to that process and what are the sort of next steps? Yeah, Macquarie are still working with us. Um, we, we've got a number of people that have been waiting just for the study to be completed. So the data room will be reset up and available to a, a number of bodies that are already under CA. We've had a, a number of uh, the larger mining companies and also funds actually visited the site before lockdown at uh, the time of Indaba. So people are very aware, they're watching the project. Um, 
yes, South Africa has been knocked around heavily by COVID and economically and on the health side. Um, we've prided ourselves that we've had a relatively low death rate in South Africa, um, which is good. The mines are all returning to 100% production on Monday, so everybody is getting back to business. The platinum mines have largely managed to keep going, and of course they're making big profits at the moment. The gold mines with the weak rand, you know, similar to the Australian environment where the weak currency really helps you. Um, South Africa, the same thing happens because our economy is so being so weak, our rand is very weak at the moment. So in rand terms, the, the operating mines are making huge profits. And a lot of those mining companies are ex-growth. There just hasn't been any junior mine development in South Africa for the last 30 years. Therefore, there's no pipeline. They've been forced to look offshore for projects, but uh, a lot of those guys are saying, geez, if there was something like this in our backyard, we'd, we'd like to be part of it. So those uh, conversations will now continue in, in earnest. Um, we will re-engage with bankers, but we, the kind of people that we're speaking to about strategic investors, some of them um, may not even need bankers, and some of them would actually shape the way that banks do business with us. So it's more sensible that we drive the strategic investor process first and see where we end up. Um, in all likelihood, we will end up with a big brother that, that can help us. Um, you know, the, the one thing that's acknowledged here is because we've achieved this as a junior explorer mine planning company, People take their hats off to Orion for what we've achieved in South Africa. The prominence that we've got um, in the government circles and all of that kind of thing really helps. And some of the, the old boys needed to learn some of those lessons. So there's a, there's a good symbiosis that can come out of this in the future. But let's see where those discussions take us. Thanks, Errol. Um Gavin Weems actually just texted me a, a question just just on the financing path. I think you you probably you sort of partly answered it, but um, there's a there's a bit of interest in the base metal space at the moment. There's a few deals being announced. There's a few there's been some big raisings, and I guess uh, Presk is one of the few development ready assets out there in the in the base metals world. It, so do you want to just sort of comment a bit more about? the prospects for funding yeah. a project like this in this Look, environment? Look, copper is one of the hot metals at the moment. Um, almost all the analysts have got consensus on one thing. Copper is the one metal that's really going to be in demand as the markets recover, um, probably followed by nickel and zinc still as a very strong growth base um, to come off. What people have underestimated is the damage that was done during this very long drought. You know, the, the long period of low metal prices meant that the pipeline got drained. They just aren't large projects that can come online in time to fill the hole in 2024. And that's why projects like this, that, you know, it's frustrating for us that it's going to take 33 months to build it and get it into production. But 33 months is actually very quick for a base metal operation starting from scratch. And for an operation with these kind of operating costs um, to come online just at the perfect timing, so you get the benefit of building now while your construction costs are the lowest that they've been in many, many years. You know, with oil prices down, cement prices down, steel prices down, the, the la even the labor market is capped to a large extent that's a huge opportunity for us. Um, I'd hate to be building a mine somewhere in the world where I'm going to rely on expats for the next two years because of disruption on flying people around the world, mobilizing people efficiently and cost efficiently is going to be tough. So environments where you've got skilled um, professional and labor sets and environments where you produce most of your consumables locally, those are going to be the winners. And that's where we think South Africa has got a great opportunity. For all that South Africa is maligned, that's where the opportunity lies. So, you know, I see even the likes of 
some big iron ore producers suddenly moving into copper. Um, I look at the NPV of that project and man, it's not orders of magnitude away from where we are and you see the numbers being paid for those projects. So we're not remote, um, we've got the services, we've got everything in place. Um, and I think that we, the whole of Southern Africa is going to see a renewal, renewal of uh, the whole base metal boom. Thanks, Errol. And maybe just one final question, just for the benefit of people over here in WA. There's a, there's a lot happening in the Fraser Range at the moment, and you, you covered off on your exploration JV with IGO. There's plenty of interest in that new discovery that Legend Mining have had. Have you got a, a sort of an idea of the of what their exploration program in, will involve and what the timeline is towards possible diamond drilling of your targets? Yeah, look, we know that they've been working on upgrading the roads out there at our site. Um, we speak to the, the managers there on a regular basis. They were hoping that by June, the roads would be complete. They've been drilling well fields. We know that they've uh, intersected good water at a couple. We haven't heard the testing results yet, but they've established water. They are busy with a regional air core drilling program and they've moved that rig onto our site now um, to drill an air core program. And you will see Legend and, and at Mawson, they're doing more of the same. They're continuing with air core drilling because it's a very useful tool. But um, we've got one of the easiest walk-up targets because last year when IGO drilled there, they intersected quite a good off-hole conductor right next to some uh, sulfides that they did pick up in the hole. So geologically, our site at uh, Hook and at Pike is very, very similar to what they've got at Mawson. The rocks look the same, they feel the same from the geologists that have been there. I haven't touched it myself yet, but the IGO geologists are telling us that our, our rock conditions are exactly the same as what's down the trend at Mawson. And uh, we've got a massive off-hole conductor, so there's an immediate walk-up target. So they have been speaking uh, late this quarter or next quarter, the diamond bricks will be turning again. Fantastic. Well, no doubt lots of people will be watching that and also what happens with, with your main project in South Africa over the next, uh, the next weeks and months. So we'll, uh, we'll wind things up there. Errol, thanks very much for making yourself available so early in the morning and congratulations on great announcement today. Um, if anyone would like further information, the members of the Orion team are more than happy to, to chat you in the course of the day. But Thanks very much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we will release a recording of this, uh, of this call a bit later on. So thanks again, everyone, and uh, we'll look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks, everyone.